Hey YouTubers, it's me, Lonnie Clark, Nuts for Art, and I'm going to finish reading. Well, not finish reading, but I'm going to do another reading of the he Oral Histories, the Human Radiation Studies, Remembering the Early Years, Oral History of Dr. John W. Goffman, MD, PhD, conducted December 20th, 1994, United States Department of Energy, Office of Human Radiation Experiments, June 1995. And about the headdress, I'm actually doing this in solidarity with our Muslim sisters here in the United States who are looked at with uh, a, a sideways eye, like there's something wrong with them or something. And to be honest, dressing like this is actually pretty awesome when you go out into public because it levels the even playing field. Uh, this is one of the things we're going to be talking about on my radio show, The Age of Fission, uh, this month, in fact, with a, uh, an MD. Um, she has a PhD, I guess, in anthropology and women's studies. So, But I'm going to continue because I uh, want to get through this reading. We are in a new subsection, and it is titled, The Controversy Over Nuclear-Armed Anti-Ballistic Missiles. 1969, Goffman. They built us the building. Glenn Seaborg came out for the dedication of the building, and I did get back to the lab after two years and started working on chromosomes and cancer and radiation. Everything went fine until the anti-ballistic missile treaty was being considered in the Senate. A guy by the name of Ernest Sternglass had done some calculations and was inspired in Esquire and was cited in Esquire in an article titled, The Death of All Babies. His estimate was that 400,000 children were going to be hurt with genetic disease as a result of the weapons program. Way fucking more than 400,000, dude. The Washington office of AEC sent out certain glasses, paper to me and the directors and other installations. I gave it to Tamplin to look at. Tamplin looked at it and wrote something that he, he was going to send to the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. We forwarded that to Washington and response, the AEC said, let's have a response of your view. What Tamplin did was recalculated that the maximum number would be more like 4,000, not 400,000. So we sent that to Washington and the next thing, I heard was from Mike May. He said, Jack, I don't know what's going on, but Washington's very unhappy with Tamplin's report on the stern glass thing. So I said, I think they'd love it because they're just, we're, he's just saving their skin. 4,000 is a hazard, not 400,000, not the death of all babies. He suggested I call John, T John Totter up and find out what the hell was going on. So I said, sure. I called John Totter, the head of the AEC Division of Biology and Medicine at that time. The head of Biology and Medicine because I put him there. Gorley, how did that work? Goffman, it worked this way. Spoff English and I were graduate students together in chemistry. Both of us worked with Seaborg. Spoff had elected to give up his assistant professorship at Berkeley Chemistry and had gone back at the Atomic Energy Commission with Seaborg and had moved up to a higher position. He called me one day and said, Chuck Dunham's moving over to the National Acad Academy of Medicine. Whom shall we choose for the head of biology and medicine? I said, John Totter is your man, and he was appointed, and that's how it worked. He later said some very nasty things about me, and I probably don't know what that was because my recommendation that he became, excuse me, and probably doesn't know that it was because of my recommendation that he became the head of biology and medicine. As usual, the people that you help talk shit about you. So I called up John Totter. He and Spoff English were on the phone. That's the name of somebody, folks. Spoff English. S-P-O-F-F. -F. For real. Yeah, Spoff I knew very well. We were graduate students together. 
I said, I understand you're unhappy with Tamplin's report on the stern glass issue. They said, oh no, we're not unhappy about that, but we think that the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists is not the place to put it. It ought to be in some more restricted genetics journal. I said, gee whiz, this is public fanfare. What could make more sense than to put the work in the Bulletin of, of Atomic Scientists? The public can see it. No, no, we think it ought to be in the genetics journal. And I blew up and I said, well, look, John and Spoff, what you want is a whitewash and you can go to hell. And I said that. It's not the most polite thing to say, but you know, it was so damn blatant that I just couldn't take it. Err, he told them to go to hell. Oh. Then I saw Mike May. Did you talk to John Totter, he asked, and I said, yes. He said, how did that turn out? And I said, I told John Totter to go to hell, and it was awful, and nothing else was said. That blew over, too. Gorley. So now, all of this was around 1969? Goffman, yes, around 1969. These two things happened in 69. One, I got an invitation from the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers to give one of the plenary addresses to their annual meeting, which was to be on nuclear matters, and it was in San Francisco. One of my engineers got the invitation. I said, sure, I'll do that. Another thing happened. There was going to be a symposium on nuclear power. The AAAS was going to hold it, and whoever was the chairman of that thing asked if I'd give a talk there. I said, well, that's on nuclear power. Tamplin is far more versed on the details of the hazards there. Why don't you extend the invitation to Tamplin? So they said they would, and they did. Then I gave my talk to the Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers. By the way, have you heard about Le Fonds Terrible? Like myself, the paper I gave there, the most conciliatory, modest, soft pedal paper, where we suggested there was a danger of something like 16 or 32,000 deaths per year if everybody got the allowable dose. I think it was 32,000, not 16. Funny how he cut it in half, 16 or 32,000, huh? Okay, new subtitle here, folks. Ethical responsibility to prove technology is not is safe. Ethical responsibility to prove technology is safe. Wow, listen to this. Ethical responsibility to prove technology is safe. Gourley. Going back a little, I found a speech that you had given in 57 to the Public Relations Society of America. The quote that I pulled it out of said, there is no provable harmful effects of radiation due to testing. Goffman, that's right. Have you ever seen a little book that I wrote called Irreverie and the Irreverent, an Illustrated View of Nuclear Power? Oh, it's awesome. I have it right here. Gourley, no, I haven't. Goffman, remind me to give you a copy before we break up today. Gourley, okay. Goffman, in that book, which was written in 79, I said, in all this talk about things that are done in violation of Nuremberg principles that I thought was a good candidate for the Nuremberg trials. Oh, really? Gourley said. Goffman, I suggested that on these grounds. I said in the mid-50s, I had been such an enthusiast for technical, technical development that I resented anybody who wanted to stand in the way of technical development until they had proved there was something bad about it. That talk was during that period, and soon thereafter I gave a lot of thought to it. My God! That's the worst possible position I can imagine. I said after that, I thought that giving that talk and the position I took, 
that you don't interfere with technology unless you can prove the opposite. It was a good basis for having a Nuremberg trial. Gorley. Do you think a lot of scientists during the 70s or even through today still have the view? Goffman, absolutely, absolutely. They virtually think that it's the public's duty to prove they're being harmed, not the duty to prove it's safe. And I think just the opposite. But I have thought the opposite from, the, from late 57 after that. And you're absolutely right about that talk. It was the most senseless position I can imagine. That's why I wrote about it in 1979 as the basis for a Nuremberg trial. I've given talks on that subject too. The place where I've been stupid, it's really just amazing. Gorley. Are there any other places where you've been stupid? Doing. Kaufman, oh man, man of humility, listen to this. Probably, probably. I can't imagine all of them, but there must be some others. He can't imagine where. You know, there was no big flack about that. The regents were worried about what and about that, and I did talk to the Board of Regents. I said, look, I don't believe a case has been made. You don't realize that things are not coming along very fast at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Leukemia had come along, and they were already pretty sure in the 50s about the excess of leukemia. Linking Radiation to Breast Cancer, 1965, new subtitle. Oh my God, you guys. I'm sorry. Bit tile. Okay, Goffman. But do you know that by 1965, not a word had come out of the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission on Breast Cancer, which we now know is the most sensitive tissue to radiation-induced cancer. A doctor in Nova Scotia by the name of Ian McKenzie published a paper on the British Journal of Cancer saying, I had a lady come into my office with a breast cancer. It looked to me as if, as if she'd had a lot of radiation over the skin over the breast cancer. I asked her about it, and she didn't know of any radiation. It turned out that she had been in a TB sanatorium for 15 or 20 years before, and the then leading therapy of tuberculosis was to inject air into inject air into the space between the chest wall and the lung. That's called pneumo, pneumothorax, air in the thorax. The idea was to rest the lung. It's an extremely important technique because people who didn't get their lungs at rest where the part of the lung had already been eaten up by TV, even though they didn't seem sick, continued to spew out tuberculoids. But when they had the rest of the lung, the two parts came together and they stopped spewing out the tuberculosis and went home instead of going to the graveyard. So the treatment by pneumothorax was the leading therapy for TB. There were people who looked like they were, excuse me, there were people who looked like they were going to do fine before that and went on to die because it wasn't available to them before 1927 or 28. So she had this pneumothorax treatment and had been fluoroscoped 200 times. Oh dear, did I skip a page? I think so. Uh-oh. Ding, da da dong dong She, who, this doesn't make sense. Okay. So this is what his next sentence was. So he had this pneumothorax treatment and had been fluoroscoped 200 times. She never thought she'd had radiation. She'd been fluoroscoped 200 times. On her feet, asked Gorley. No, on her chest, said Goffman, because they wanted to see if there was still air left from the previous injection, and do you need a new one? So they were just checking these people by fluoroscopy, and that's where she got a hell of a big dose of radiation. 
So Mackenzie went to the sanatorium records, pulled out the records of about 800 women, and it was about 570 who hadn't had the treatment and a few hundred that had, and it showed that there was about a 20 to 15-fold excess in breast cancer. As a result of that, in 65, the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki said, well, Mackenzie found this. We have to find something here. Then they looked and they published that they were having breast cancers in Hiroshima and Nagasaki from the radiation. Gourley. Now, was this data gathered by DBM at Livermore as well? Goffman. You mean the Japanese data? That came directly out of the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission. We were looking at things like that. So I'm trying to point it out to you that everything wasn't too well known at that time. Gourley. People didn't always know where to look? Goffman. I don't know why they didn't, but they weren't up to speed on looking at the thing out of Japan. But they corrected it, and after that they looked pretty hard at the breast cancer, and they did some nice work on breast cancer in Japan. New subtitle, Conflict with the AEC over Low-Level Radiation Effects, 1969. And I'm going to end here. Let me see how many minutes we have going on. Well, just about right, 16 minutes. So put your courage feet on, you guys. Uh, let's lean into our democracy. Let's stand up for each other. Let's love each other. And uh, let's remember that we're all just like human beings with for real hair, real espejos, and all of that stuff. So ciao, you guys. Put your courage feet on. Ciao.